some noise in hell. Good afternoon, Kingdom Man. My name is Nedwin Winters, and as, as most of you know, and, and for those who are tuning in for the first time, I'm co-leader with Pastor Davis of the book Kingdom Man by Tony Evans. I hope everyone is doing well during these times of COVID-19, as well as the injustices and race relations uh, that we're dealing with right now. But today, uh, I'm excited about continuing our journey through this book. Uh, I want to spend uh, this 30 minutes or so uh, recapping our intro and, and jumping into chapter one and redoing that as well. And next week, we'll, we'll look at chapter two. Uh, we've only got 30 minutes, so let's, let's jump into it. Throughout the Bible, Jesus speaks of a treasure. Uh, Jesus calls this treasure the kingdom of God. Webster tells me that a kingdom is a country, a state, or territory ruled by a king or queen. Webster also tells me that the kingdom is a spiritual reign and authority of God. Uh, Matthew 13, 44 says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has to buy this field. Men, Jesus says the kingdom is an unusually valuable treasure. Jesus says that absolutely nothing should stand in our way. Have you ever had anything that you valued so much that nothing stood in your way of getting it? Have you ever uh, gone beyond all your doubts and fears to get this item or treasure or good or whatever it was? Maybe it was a lady. <laughs> Maybe it was a, a grade in class. But, you know, I, th I think back and I remember when I was a kid, I knew I was going to get in trouble, but I would always make the trek to the, the local gas station to buy candy. To me, that was a true treasure, right? I, I gave up everything. I gave up the punishment that I was gonna receive. I gave up my money. I gave up the, the, I guess, the sweat of riding my bike to the place and coming back. And when I got that candy, I valued it as a treasure, right? I held on to it as long as I could. I didn't wanna share. I hid it from other people. So just, just think about that. Is, is there anything that, that you guys value so much that nothing stopped you from trying to go get it. Jesus says the kingdom of God is that treasure, and that's how we should feel about it. Uh, the kingdom of God is set up through principles, covenants, responsibilities, privileges, rights, rules, ethics, coverings, and authorities. Uh, from that, we can conclude that a, a kingdom man, title of the book, is someone who operates in that kingdom, someone who takes hold of that treasure and runs with it. Uh, on this journey, man, we're gonna discover these principles. We're gonna discover these covenants, these responsibilities, these privileges, these rights, these rules. We're gonna discover this priceless treasure. Again, have, have you taken hold of this treasure? Have, have you accessed the kingdom of God? Sometimes I want to sit and think about, and I'm guilty of this myself, uh, why haven't men in our society taken hold of this treasure? Do we not understand the mystery? Do we not understand what the, the kingdom of God possesses? Do we not understand the true value? Uh, maybe we feel that material possessions are our kingdom of God. Maybe we relate to what we have as being access or, or being a part of this kingdom. Maybe we settle for stuff. Have we settled for trinkets and gadgets, golf clubs, video games, cars, careers, vacation packages? You know, we, we've got to ask ourselves the tough question, what have we settled for? What have we uh, said to ourselves that, hey, we've made it, we're good enough, we've, we've done what we're supposed to be? Uh, but Man, I, I want to challenge us to transform our thinking, transforming, transform our, our, our understanding of what we've given up, our, our understanding of the kingdom of God. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Man, God has a standard. 
He has a goal. His kingdom is that standard in that goal. Yet, so many of us have lowered this standard, have lowered this goal. Uh, Tony points out in the book, one of his sons uh, invited him to come watch him dunk the basketball. He went and watched, he dunked the basketball, only to find out that he had lowered the goal. One of those adjustable goals, you can lower it down to eight foot, you know, I can dunk on that all day, right? So he had lowered that goal, and essentially, that's, that's kind of what we've, we've done to God. We've lowered his goal, we've lowered his standard, and it's time to raise that goal back up. You know, so many are affected by us lowering the goal, not meeting God's standard. Uh, it shows up in our country, in our world, in economics, in our homes, in our churches, in our communities, all across the goal. The goal. So let's, let's take a minute and, and just think about uh, some of the things that show up because of this lowered standard. Let's list a few. I'll give you a brief second. So what I see is promiscuity, emptiness, depression, chronic irresponsibility, family breakup, misuse of finances, divorce, violence, chemical addiction, overeating, indulgence, ban bankruptcy, low self-esteem, and general aimlessness that plague our society. And, and these are all listed in, in our book. Uh, look around to our deteriorating society. Again, we, we just need to turn on the news today and see what uh, we're doing actually in Houston, <laughs> you know, in, in Detroit and other cities around the, the nation. Uh, this must change, uh, man. That change will not occur unless men are willing to rise to the standard to where God had originally placed it. This book, our study is about raising that standard and defining manhood as God intended it to be. This book is about discovering what it means to be a kingdom man. All right, let's jump into uh, chapter one. That, that introduction has me <laughs> a little giddy, right? Gave me goof, goosebumps just thinking about uh, the challenges that we face being a kingdom man. The cry for a kingdom man. This is chapter one of the book. Uh, how would you define manhood? Did your dad define it? your wife, your mother, your friends? How would you say society d defines manhood? Uh, what do TV shows and mo movies and popular music say about being a man? Now, now take just a brief moment and, and picture that in your head, of your idea of a man based on what your family has told you, your friends have told you, and what society has told you. Now, I want, to, I want you to take that image, man, crumple it up, and toss it out the window. Uh, only thing that matters is the definition that God gives of manhood. God has defined manhood for us, and he's painted a picture of what a kingdom man should look like. Now remember, a kingdom man operates within the kingdom of God. When a kingdom man steps out his door each day, heaven, earth, and hell take notice. When he protects the woman under his care, she can do little to resist him. His children look to him with confidence. Other men look to him as someone to emulate. His church calls on him for strength and leadership. He preserves the culture and the champion of society. Wow. <laughs> wow. You know, all those things are, again, man, what, what we're dealing with right now. I'm guilty. I'll, I'll be the first one, first one to tell you that. I hadn't done all these things. I, I, I don't know sometimes what my children think of me. I, I know my wife is mad at me sometimes. And, and, you know, does my church call on me for, for leadership? You know, does the society, a, am I active in the community? A, am I doing things to not just promote my better good, but the good of those around me? That's, that's what a kingdom man is called to do. A kingdom man zeroes in on the purpose, and one purpose only, advancing the kingdom for the betterment of those within it, which glorifies the king, our God, and he will pursue it at any cost. Think back to that story about the candy. I pursued it at any cost. Um, you know, Tony talks about 
football analogies quite a bit in the book. And, and one, one example he, he, he talks about is a third team being on the field. And I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with football and there are two teams. And then the third team, as he, he points out, is a team of officials. Without the officials on the, on the, on the field, it will be consumed with chaos. Right? Wouldn't you agree? But the thing about the team of officials, they're not committed to either team. They're committed to the league office, the NFL office, and they've got a rule book that governs us. One thing that we're going to point out in this book is that we are essentially the third team on the field, man. We, we have a rule book that we answer to, the kingdom of God, that no matter who's pulling at us, no matter which side is trying to get our attention or trying to get us to side with them, we have to make our decision based on that rule book. Who are you committed to? What kingdom do you belong to? Easy answer, right? Like I just said, we should, guilty, we should be committed to the kingdom of God. Men, we're in a battle. We're at war. You know, the stakes of this war and its casualties are high. Lives will be lost, eternities will be shaped, destinies will either be discovered or dismissed. Dreams will be attained or relinquished. Relinquished. How does it feel to be responsible for lives, man? How does it feel to be responsible for eternities and destinies and dreams? Kingdom men, we are placed here on earth for a specific reason, and we receive our instructions from God himself. We, have, we cannot be swayed by the majority. Now, you know, that's popular preferences and things that the societies are doing, everyone else is doing. We can't let that interfere with, with what we've been called to do. We must make our calls according to the book, to the Bible. As we dig deeper into chapter number one, guys, I want to pull out three major points. The world is in dire need... No, Point number one, the world is in dire need of godly leadership. Point number two, God is ultimate Lord God and is ruler of all. Point number three, Lord God has given kingdom men authority. The cry for kingdom men. If I hadn't stated it enough, I would like to present to you that this world is in dire need. Look around you. Every child born, raised without a father, Every woman's dream drowned by irresponsible or re neglectful man. Every hope snuffed out by confusing circumstances. Every lonely soul of a single woman searching for someone to, worthy to marry. And every sanctuary and community devoid of significant male contributions. Look at our world leadership. Look at our community leaders. This is extremely convicting for me. What have I done? or what have I not done to help promote the kingdom of God? Take a moment, guys, and just look at the signs around you each day, that part of your personal world. Now, this is not to condemn anyone, but more so to challenge us to really understand and take hold of this treasure that Jesus speaks of. God is ultimate Lord God. The kingdom agenda is simply the visible demonstration of comprehensive rule of God over every area of our, of our life, govern, governed by a covenant system. A covenant system is an agreement between God and his people in which God makes promises to his people and usually requires certain conduct from them. This is found in Genesis 9, verses 1 through 17. Now, let's, let's not look over that last part requires certain conduct. The kingdoms and institutions include the family, the church, and the government. These are three areas that will encompass every area of our life that, de that we deal with. Let's take a moment, just take a look at, at those three. Our family, you know, the people we live with, our, our church where we worship God, and our community where, and our community and our government where we interact with those around us, people in our community. Uh, failure to live according to the kingdom of God and the rule book 
will send our lives in chaos and disorder and loss. Uh, I, I know that we've all dealt with uh, loss and chaos in our lives. Let's, I want to jump into uh, chapter 2 real quick of Genesis, uh, if you turn with me. I just want to read just the beginning of, of a few verses. Because part of this is pointing out that God is ultimate Lord God. Uh, let's look at verse number 15 of chapter 2. The Lord God took man and put him in the garden. Let's jump down to 18. The Lord God said, chap, number, verse number 19. Now the Lord God, as we can see, each one of these verses begin with Lord God. Anytime you see Lord in all caps, it refers to Yahweh. Yahweh means master and absolute ruler. So we have to take that into our hearts, man, and digest it, that God is ultimate and absolute ruler. Without authority and acknowledgement of his true authority, there is anarchy resulting in mess. You know, knowing, knowing this, this is exactly why or how Satan uh, got Eve to sin or got Adam and Eve to sin. Real quickly, let's turn to chapter 3 of that. And I want to read the first verse. First through number three. Now a certain was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the certain, serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. Let me stop right there. Uh, as you can see, Satan took out Lord God. All, th all through this chapter, from, from uh, chapter 1, 2, and 3, it was Lord God, Lord God. And Satan subtly took out Lord God and just, made, and just said, God, how many subtle uh, things happen in our lives each day that um, just, just a little bit away from, the God, from God's word and his way of his precepts and his, his uh, authority and his rule? just a little bit away from, from our uh, ways of operating, from, from what can usually convicts us. You know, it's just the subtle little things. Like, you know, I, I think back uh, when I was a kid, you would never hear cursing on TV, right? When I was a kid, you'd never uh, hear certain words on TV and on the radio. But nowadays, it's like regular television. You don't even have to be on HBO to see uh, more cursing, more violence, more uh, nudity, more just small, little, subtle things that have gradually made our way or made their way into our lives. Uh, but the thing about it is, um, it wasn't Eve who got in trouble with the first sin. When God came looking, he came looking for Adam. He didn't come looking for Eve. He said, Adam, where are you? And the thing about it, and I've read this, I've read Genesis so many times throughout my life, and I, recently I just realized that Adam was right there with Eve. She gave to her husband, which was with her. Think about that just for a minute, men. We sit there and we let subtle serpent come into our lives and change the way we should be operating. Adam sat right there and didn't say anything. You know, in, when, when God first put him in the garden, he brought the animals to him and, and he was talking up a storm. And we'll get into that in later chapters in the book. He was naming things, talking with the God. But when, certain, when Satan came in, the serpent came in, he was suddenly quiet. And he gave, as, as Tony pointed out, he gave all authority to Satan right then and there. As Tony pointed out, he fumbled the ball, guys. He dropped the ball. Has God mastered an absolute ruler in your life? Has the Lord, the ultimate authority, dictative rule in your life been taken out? Has the Lord, the title, been taken out of your title for God? 
How do we get back to Lord God? How can we make God our master and absolute ruler in our lives? What have we done to lose fellowship with Lord God? It had been Adam who God had revealed himself to as Lord God in the context of giving Adam divine instruction. As a result, Adam was ultimately held responsible. Men, we are ultimately held responsible. Adam made the decision to disobey God. When we make decisions based on our own thoughts, beliefs, or values, like Adam did, rather than based on what God has, has to say as ruler, then we are choosing to rule ourselves as Adam did. We are choosing to call the king of God without recognizing his authority by removing his rightful name as Lord God. God's authority. Let's read Exodus 34, 23 through It says in there, three times a year, all their males were to appear together before him to receive instructions from God. He called the men to submit themselves to his complete authority. And when the men submitted, those who were connected to him would receive God's covering, protection, and provision. But they, receive, they would receive this only if they positioned themselves under his absolute rule. Men, the same principle applies today. God's rulership applies to us no different than they did with the Israelites. If we submit ourselves unto God, his covering, his protection, and his provision will apply to us. A kingdom man, again, is someone who visibly demonstrates the comprehensive rule of God underneath the lordship of Jesus Christ in every area of, of our lives. A kingdom man who rules according to God's rule. Just as a referee in an NFL game is able to rule according to the rule book, a kingdom man is released to rule when he makes his decision and orders his world according to God's rule. God has the ultimate rule book, man. A kingdom man must function according to the principles and precepts of this rule book. There'll be, and when he does, there'll be order, authority, and provision. Yet, when we don't, when he doesn't, we open ourselves up to, and those connected to us, a life of chaos. Man, we must realize first that God created it all, he owns it all, and God knows best. And he's given us a rule book to govern ourselves by. I want to end this uh, chapter one with two examples that uh, Tony gives in his book. Uh, the first example is the miracle on the Hudson. On January 15, 2009, a potential disaster turned into a heroic display of skill and composure when Captain Chesley Burnett Sullenberger safely landed a plane piloting on New York Hudson River after a bird strike caused its, its engines to fail. Sullenberger had served as an Air Force pilot, an accident investigator, an airline safety consultant, and safety manager. And he had logged in more than 19,000 hours of uneventful flight time. Imagine that, guys, a miracle on the Hudson. A plane, after birds crash into the engines, uh, causing the engines to fail, and landed it safely on the Hudson. If I remember correctly, there were over 150 people on this plane. Uh, the thing about what the pilot did that, that day, he governed his world according to the rule book. He manned up and was a kingdom man in his situation. Uh, too often we uh, make light of all the, our experiences, all the things that we go through. but. I truly believe that what 
we've learned to date will really help us govern our world well. All the time that the pilot put in prepared him for what had happened. Now, we've got to ask ourselves, uh, are we taking responsibility for ourselves and others in our realm? The second example I want to read to you is about a young lady and her children. Police said Armstrong put her four children into the family minivan Tuesday night and intentionally drove it into the Hudson River. She drowned along with her daughter and her two sons. Her eldest son, 10 years old, managed to escape. Her story reflects the countless, countless stories of lives abandoned and broken by the neglect or mistreatment of men or men in her life. Her last words, if I'm going to die, you're going to die with me, reflects the power of a man's impact for good or for bad over innocent children who may suffer a death of their destinies, their hopes, their dreams, esteem, futures, and possibly even their lives when a man's failure to rule well. Are we ruling well, man? Just like the Hudson, life has a way of also flowing both ways, good or bad. A lot depends on whether you are a kingdom man who responsibly rules with consistency and wisdom according to the guidelines God has set forth in his word. If you are a man, like it or not, you are a leader by position. You are ultimately responsible for those within your domain. Who might that be? Children, wife, community, church, on the job, all that falls within your realm. Man, how you lead will play a large part in either the life or death experiences of those within your realm. You can either lead those in your care to a place of safety, or you can drive those in your care to a place of chaos. Ruling well is a lifeline skill for through faithfulness and dedication. Stop right there, man. And, and I'm not saying that this is something, a five-step program, something we can get done overnight. This is truly, and I'm thankful for the book, this is truly something that we should be in for the long haul. Our God, the King, has given us a rule book by which we are to govern, by which we are to rule, lead, make decisions, direct God, and align our life choices. That rule book, again, is his word. When we lead according to what he says in his word, he will back us. He will give us the authority that we need. When we lead according to his principles and his kingdom agenda, we free others around us to be what they were created to be as well. Yet, when we don't, we invite a world of chaos, disorder, destruction, not only to in, in our lives, but also in the lives of those within our influence. Man, when you step out the door each day, do heaven and earth take notice? When you protect a woman under your care, can she do little to resist you? Do your children look to you with confidence? Do other men look to you as someone to emulate? Does your church call on you for strength and leadership? Are you a preserver of culture and a champion of society? one who keeps our evil and ushers in good? Are you a man who's fulfilling your destiny and able to satisfy the woman in your life? More so than that, though, when God searches for a man to advance his kingdom, does he call your name? Man, uh, you guys have a good week, and next week we'll pick it up on Chapter 2. Thank you.